So yeah, hi, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the 12th talk. I hope I got the number right. Uh, our guest speaker today is Huang Zhang from CMU. Previously, he did his PhD at UCLA. I think some of us uh, are really familiar with Juan's work, but uh, he has, uh, just to summarize, he has done, uh, made amazing contribution uh, in trustworthy, trustworthiness of uh, AI and machine learning uh, with the key focus on developing formal verification method and, and uh, to get into robustness and safety of machine learning. Juan previously won IBM PhD fellowship and uh, I think last year uh, led the winning team for the verification competition for neural networks and he was also in 2021 was um, rising uh, was the adversarial ml rising star award uh, sponsored by mit ibm watson ai lab and yeah uh, looking looking forward to your talk go on yeah thank you for the introduction i'm very happy to give my talk today to uh present some of my works on formal verification of uh deep neural networks so i'm juan um and uh i'm at Carnegie Mellon university and uh yeah very excited to give talk here um so a little bit background so we are currently in a stage where uh, ai can actually perform very well in many tasks and uh, we hope ai can help uh humans and also the entire society and uh, so we, we actually expect ai to become uh, uh part of some mission critical system um and such as medical equipment autonomous driving uh auto piloting and so on and however, uh, we know that like, AI can make some surprising mistakes, um, such as uh, we, we all know the, about other cell examples. So for, for the case where the system like, is actually mission critical and can lead to very bad so societal impact, we hope to actually formally guarantee the AI works under some certain specifications and do not make this a surprising mistakes. And uh, we don't want this mistake to happen in mission critical systems. So, uh, uh, so what, what is neural network verification? Traditionally, uh, we have uh, the entire field of program verification where you're giving a computer program, for example, your Python code, your C++ code, and you have uh, a set of input and you want, the, the, you want to verify the, the output of the program. It's always correct. There's no uh, infinite loop. There's no uh, uh, bugs or so, uh, and you're given the code. But now, supposing we are using neural networks to replace part of the system, to replace some fixed function programs uh, using some learning based approach, then we, we, we want to actually give some uh, guarantee for the black box neural network. And uh, for, for, the, uh, for the neural network verification, we typically have some input specifications which tells you like, uh, how the input looks like, so what's, uh, what's uh, the expected input of the network, and we also have output specifications, which are basically uh, the desired properties you want the network to 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 uh, to uh, behave um, under the input specification. The simple property is like given the x uh, belongs to some input perturbation set C, um, and uh, you you hope that the output uh, has some properties, for example, y2 is greater than y1, and we want this property to hold for any x within some, some perturbation set. So this is just the, uh, some um, typical setting of neural network verification. And uh, a simple example is robustness verification. Uh, for example, the input is a perturbation set around some uh, data point x0. Uh, for example, there's the image of stop sign and that's x0, and we can add some norm bounding noise around x0. So the input set is actually a ball around x0. And uh, we want to see uh, the output of the class var is always uh, predicting the noise, uh, predicting the image as a stop sign and not making any surprising mistakes. So that means for any x around this perturbation ball, uh, you, you have to guarantee that the model is always predicting stop. And the, what essentially you're, you're trying to say is if uh, the decision boundary is actually uh, intersecting with this perturbation ball, that is actually the actual property you're trying to verify here. And But uh, neural network verification is not just for robustness. It can actually be used for many other properties, for example, fairness, monotonicity, and correctness. 
Um, and uh, so I know there are many papers discussing about our robustness verification, but please just remember, uh, neuron type verification can actually, it's a general problem, and uh, you, you can actually give uh, more complex specifications for verification, um, and uh, it can be applied to many different settings. Uh, but for today's talk, I will still consider uh, the very simple setting uh, of the robustness verification for binary classification because that's very easy to understand. For, for example, uh, we have some input x0 uh, and the output of the network is fx0 and uh, based on the sign of the output and uh, we know uh, we, we classify this example as a positive example or a negative example. And uh, so the uh, canonical form of form of, of form of verification of neural network is basically saying that given that x within a perturbation set C, and can you show that f x is greater than zero? Can you just show that uh, uh, that always holds for all x uh, given x C, uh, in the perturbation set C? For example, for the binary classification case. Uh, the uh, supposing that the uh, the uh, x zero is originally a positive example, for example, stop sign, and uh, I want to show that for all the x within this box, it's always predicting a uh, stop sign. And for more complex uh, specifications, th this condition f x uh, greater than zero can be uh, can actually represent a more complex uh, condition. For example, that means the classifier is fair. Uh, and uh, that means the system is behaving correctly also. You need to define a function uh, to define a specification such that um, uh, uh, when the output of the, of the function is greater than zero, uh, the specification holds. And you want to verify that for all the x belongs to the perturbation set, uh, you can show that the property is greater than zero. So this is a canonical form for neural, neural network verification. And uh, this verification, uh, this problem is challenging because um, considering to just uh, uh, doing inference of a single data point x0, you actually have to consider a set of input as the input. So you actually uh, have to have some way to propagating, propagating uh, this entire set of points to the neural network. And you cannot just enumerate all the points because there are infinitely many points inside this perturbation set. And in that case, you can imagine because you have a, a set of uh, inputs, the output is also a set rather than a single number. So for example, uh, the fx can be between 0 0.2 and 2.2. And uh, in, in our uh, simple property to verify, we just want to verify fx is greater than 0. So we just check the worst case of fx. Um, we've seen uh, for, for x within this perturbation set, suppose we know the range of the output, and if the, this lower bound is greater than zero, and, and I know even the worst case, uh, the network is still predicting correctly, and that's that actually uh, verifies this, this specification. So uh, mathematically, uh, we can solve this simple optimization problems for neural network verification, which is basically just the saying that given that x belongs to the perturbation set C, um, you, you have to find the worst case uh, fx. And uh, you minimize, so you minimize fx within all, all, all the perturbation set. And if the minimum value of fx is greater than zero, then you actually, you can tell that uh, for this uh, uh, specification, you verify uh, this uh, property. So the network won't produce any negative number within this perturbation ball. And in a binary classification setting, it's just saying if your label is flipped or not flipped and the boundary is basically zero. And they are checking if the worst case f, uh, fx star is uh, on the other side of this boundary or not. So um, you, you can actually formulate this problem as a optimization problem because suppose we define the network layers as Z and Z hat, which are pre and activation feature values. Uh, what you are trying to minimize is uh, minimizing the output of the last layer, for example, these three here. And, and you can actually write a set of equality constraints uh, that uh, uh, 
uh, that basically means how the how each data point propagates through the network. So you just write a set of equality a constraint. For example, you have suppose you have the input x x is z hat zero, and you apply x you apply this uh, linear layers, and you apply the ravel layers, and you apply the linear ravel linear layers again, and until you get output. And uh, uh, and here instead of if x is just a single data point, then everything is just the forward propagation. But if x is within the perturbation set C, then the problem becomes tricky because you essentially need to solve this optimization problem. And this optimization problem is actually non-convex because this constraint is non-convex. This constraint basically saying that uh, the output and the input of this layer needs to be on the graph of the activation function, for example, the rival function. Um, and the graph of the rival function is actually the non-convex set. It consists of two lines. And if you just uh, combine the two lines together as a set, it's actually a non-convex set. So this problem has been shown to be NMC complete. And uh, you can technically solve the verification problem using mixed integer linear programming. Uh, and, uh, uh, but this is very slow. Actually, the, the earliest neural network verification uh, algorithms are based on mixed integer linear programming. And uh, it can only work on um, neural, uh, neural network with a few hundred neurons, maybe a few thousand at most in most cases. And uh, it's really slow because you have to run uh, the algorithm on CPU and you, you enjoy no GPU acceleration and you, you cannot really scale to any networks we are using practically today and uh, so to 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 make the uh, problem a little bit easier uh what people usually do is instead of solving this optimization problem to the global minimum we can also just solve the problem find the lower bound of the problem uh, of the optimum value f star so for example if the true f star is here and I know the, the network, uh, I know this property is uh, is hold, so the network is robust. And, uh, but we cannot solve its F star because it's too slow, it's too expensive to find its F star. But we can also use the so-called incomplete verification to actually find the lower bound of F star. And if this lower bound is greater than zero, we can also prove this property because what we, all we want to show is just to show uh, the, the alpha of this function uh, it's going to be greater than zero. And if the lower bound is greater than zero, it's, this output is always greater than zero. Uh, but of course, if the lower bound is too low, too loose, and the lower bound, for example, is very inactive, um, and you, 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 you don't know really uh, the, the, the property is hold or not, because um, uh, because in that case, uh, the true value F star can either be greater than zero or less than zero, you don't know. Because there are cases you, you cannot tell if some, the property is verified or not. So that, that's called incomplete verification. Um, so I think these are all the backgrounds for neural net verification and I hope that's clear. Um, and uh, for, for the, for, 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 for the goal of this work, um, I will introduce a little bit of the bound propagation framework for neural network verification, which I have been working with uh, uh, during the last few years, is that we developed some tools that help us to efficient, efficiently to verify uh, neural networks and uh, uh, get to know like how this black box uh, neural network behave. And uh, some structured strategies I used uh, are uh, efficient bound propagation. So we are not relying on uh, linear programming or MIPSOR. And uh, everything is GPU accelerated, so you are not restricted to, to CPUs. And also everything can be optimized using gradient ascent to achieve a tighter bound. And we also can use branch and bound to achieve complete verification. So, uh, so I will basically quickly mention a few works uh, I have done during uh, the last few years, starting from the uh, most uh, simplest uh, uh, bound propagation uh, framework called Crown, and uh, 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 a way to tighten the bounds called Alpha Crown to make, make the bounds even tighter, and also you can optimize on GPU, and also combine this bound propagation method uh, with a uh, branch and bound to achieve greater power. As beta Crown, and recently we also have paper uh, of applying cutting flow methods uh, to neural network verification problem um, that's called GCP Chrome. 
essentially, um, what you are uh, seeing here is we're building, we're trying to build in a specialized MIF solver because the problem is essentially a NP complete problem. It's sort of like you are solving a MIF problem, but but we are building just building a specialized solver that works very well for the neural net verification problem by exploiting the structure of this problem as well as uh, enabling uh, GPU acceleration. So you can find out the, the, the our website at uh, avcron.org website. And, uh, and I will basically give some high level overview of all the algorithms here uh, in today's talk. So we will start with the uh, most basic bound of propagation method called cron. So remember that what we are, the problem we, we, we are trying to solve is basically find the lower bound or even better, if you if you want to solve this minimization problem, but for incomplete verifiers, uh, we just want to find a lower bound uh, in a fast manner. If its lower bound is greater than zero, then we can show the network is uh, robust, for example. And the uh, cron is an uh, efficient uh, algorithm to 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 find a lower bound for this uh, for the neural network function in a bound propagation manner, and I'll show you how that works. So to motivate, uh, suppose we have just linear networks, we don't have random neurons. Everything is simple because you actually, uh, you have a um, linear relationship between the input and output. And you can actually merge all the layer weights together. And you, so you know just the output is a linear relationship of the input. And in that case, actually finding the worst case perturbation for any LP norm perturbation, it's actually quite easy. You can just apply holders inequality and you get exact F star. So you solve the, the verification problem very easily for linear classification. Um, but the, the tricky thing in uh, modern neural networks is you do have these nonlinear activations like ReLUs or other activation functions. So that, that's a little tricky and we have to find a better way to handle this uh, nonlinear operations in order to achieve uh, incomplete verification. So the way we, we handle the ReLU function is converting the nonlinear ReLU function uh, two linear functions by linearly bound the lower and upper bounds of linear uh, of the real function. For example, given this real function, suppose we know its input is between L and U. We, we know the input of this real is within its range. And we can actually use two linear lines to lower and upper bound the real function. Uh, if the, in that case, you can imagine we magically transform the nonlinear network into some sort of a linear network, but the, uh, but, but we're replacing the nonlinear value neurons with some linear bounds. So the, the, we're essentially getting some bounds instead of the, the exact value. So I will quickly go over how this process works. For, for example, we have a three-layer network, very simple here, just fully connected layers with some weights and some red neurons. And the, the bound propagation works by propagating inequalities from the output to the input. So I'll show you how the propagation process works. So from the output, we, we have the definition fx equals to zero, uh, z3. That can be seen as the uh, inequality between fx and z3. Yeah, and uh, propagating this that to the z hat two is easy. You just plug in the definition um z three equals to z w three transpose z hat two by definition, and you can see this as the inequality between f x as z hat two. So so far everything is very simple, and you just get actually exact equality here. Uh, but if as long as you have a red layer, things become a little bit more tricky. Uh, you, you, the idea here is replacing the red layer with a diagonal matrix. And this diagonal matrix reflects a linear relaxation of the red neurons, such that you can still propagate these linear equal inequalities through the network. Here you get a linear inequality uh, of fx uh, with respect to the impulse value Z2. But here, uh, you, you see we have the inequality here, but here you have the inequality because we have this uh, inequalities to bound the red neurons. So for, for example, we, we, we have the lower near lower bound and near upper bounds for red neuron. And this matrix D actually um, incorporates this uh, 
linear lower and upper bounds into this matrix. And how to design how what are the exact value of this matrix is a little bit complicated. I will not show you the exact form in today's talk, but you, you imagine that to propagate the inequality through the network, you just replace red neuron with a diagonal matrix. And the diagonal matrix basically depends on the linear lower and the upper bound we used to, to bound this nonlinear function. So after that, you, you still get a linear inequality from fx to z2. And you just continue this process. And you, you plug in the definition of uh, z2 equals w2 z hat 1. And so that, that basically propagates the inequality through another layer. You have the inequality between fx to z hat 1. And you have another level there. Uh, and we do a similar thing as we did before, just to replace that. Red layer with the diagonal matrix reflecting the linear lower and upper bounds of the red neuron. And uh, until you keep doing this propagation until you reach the input. And uh, here you get linear relationship between fx and x. And as you can see here, everything here is just a bunch of matrix multiplication. So you can you can get a lower bound for the function, but just doing a bunch of uh, uh, matrix multiplications without using any MIPS solver or LP solver, just uh, uh, just to do matrix multiplication, which is uh, what GPU is good at, and you can actually compute this very fast. And uh, in this way, you get the chron linear lower bound. Chron linear lower bound is, is basically a linear lower bound for, for this function fx. So you are bounding the fx with a linear function uh, with coefficients a and c. And this linear function holds for all the, uh, all the x within this perturbation set. And the coefficients of the linear bound can actually be easily computed by a bunch of uh, matrix multiplications. And you can do that efficiently on GPUs. And uh, at high level, what we are doing is propagating inequalities through the network and from the output layer to the input layer, and you get linear inequalities like this. So you are actually uh, bounding the nonlinear function, nonlinear and non convex function, which is very hard to optimize, which with a simple linear function. And if you want to find the lower bound for this linear function, that's actually a very easy task because finding a lower bound of the linear function from a single perturbation set, for them, is one dimensional case. It's very easy. It's just going to be uh, on one end of this uh, of this linear line. So that's going to be f star crown, which is a lower bound of the original problem. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we just want to show the lower bound is positive. If this lower bound is greater than zero, we actually verify the property. So that's how the bound of propagation framework works. Um, and uh, during the process, um, there, there's a very interesting, very interesting thing is that uh, if we look at the lower bound of the rather function, um, actually, you, you find that you, you have flexibilities. That means you can choose any lower bound uh, with slope from zero to one. So actually, to all, it's always go, give you a lower bound for the variable function and always give you a very lower bound for the entire bound of propagation. So you actually have an adjustable uh, lower bound. That means you can actually find the optimal lower bound to, to make the uh, final lower bound as tight as possible by optimizing the slope of the relative relaxation. So if we denote the slope of the relative relaxation as alpha, actually you, you can actually uh, turn the verification problem into a max mean problem. And the max is over uh, alpha because every alpha between zero and one, so that's the slope of the lower bound, is actually a valid lower bound. So you can choose between you can choose between zero and one. You can optimally set alpha. Uh, at high level, what we're doing is that by optimally choosing the alpha, uh, you're actually you 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 kind of make the lower bound uh, tighter. So in our ori original Chrome paper, we actually we, we just use a, a heuristic to find the alpha. But if you optimize the alpha, you usually can get better uh, lower bounds by doing this optimization. So this is presented in our Eclair 2021 paper. Um, so and uh, another thing you might want to ask is uh, I demonstrate all the bound propagation thing on a very simple fully connected layers, but how? What if we we have, for example, convolution layers and uh, ResNet and so on and more complex uh, architectures, and uh, we can actually extend this propagation of linear inequalities 
uh, through a general computational graph instead of just uh, 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 using my deriv derivation on a linear network, you, uh, on the on the uh, fully connected network, you can actually derive the same thing by treating a neural net function as a computational graph. If you do that, actually, you still propagate the inequalities. Uh, here, I is basically the coefficients of the inequality. You start with ident identity matrix and propagate that through the entire network until you reach all the input nodes of the computation graph, which are basically the either X or uh, W. W is basically the weights, and all of them are 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 input node of this computation graph, and you basically propagate the inequalities through the network layer by layer. And uh, you for linear operations, you just multiply the that, that uh, linear operation to 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 the in, to the linear inequality you are propagating, but for nonlinear operations you need uh, the relaxations uh, like what we did for the Rado function. You can, for example, relax the uh, uh, hyperbolic tangent function or exponential function or other functions. You can actually relax these nonlinear functions. So uh, it looks very complicated. So if you want to run this algorithm on on your uh, own network, you have to re-implement everything. That's of course not good. So we actually we do have a very good library built for verification. Uh, our library is written in PyTorch, such as you just need to define uh, your PyTorch model as an N dot module, just like how you define your uh, PyTorch model regularly. And you just use import our library called Auto Learpad, automatic linear relaxation uh, based perturbation analysis as uh, Auto Learpad. Yeah, and um, you, you can wrap your model with this so called bounding module object. And you can define the input perturbation by using a so-called bounded tensor object. And the, the, so the, the input of the model is a bounded tensor. And you can actually call the built-in method called compute bounds. Yeah, and, uh, and you can actually compute the bounds I mentioned above, uh, I mentioned before, uh, for a arbitrary computational graph. For example, you can have uh, dense net, resonant transformers, LSTMs, other uh, irregular networks, everything can be done quite simply. So at high level, what our network is doing is like, we, we, are, we are taking a computational graph or any uh, neural networks. And so what Petworks gives you is you have a model, uh, you have the data and the weights as an input of the computational graph, and you get scores for each class. And what our library provides you is actually uh, given certain input perturbations on either the model or the weights, and you actually you get guaranteed bounds for the output. You have the bounds, for example, for cat, for dog, for panda, you get the score for, for each class. And for example, if you know the lower bound of cat is now it's, it's always bigger than the upper bound of dog and panda, you know that the class where will always produce cat within the 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 uh, input perturbation or weight perturbations. It's very interesting is that most people, uh, for example, working on robustness, um, uh, most look for perturbations on input space, but using our algorithm, because we work for general computational graphs, you can actually apply perturbation analysis on the weights as well. So this can be helpful in some cases, like for example, you can know like how, how flat the lost landscape is um, using our library. Uh, uh, it can have applications beyond, for example, robustness and uh, the typical setting of verification. And if you're interested in this uh, library, you, you should check out our collab level, uh, collab demo, and uh, as well uh, as we have a uh, code here on GitHub, and uh, the demo basically shows that how to compute the bounds for the 18 layer resonant model without knowing all the com complicated algorithms I introduced before. You just call the call the library, just call the compute bound function, and the bounds are computed for you, and the bounds are computed on GPUs and the scales to pretty large networks, and also it runs on GPUs and uh, it's very efficient. Um, so cool. And, and, uh, and, but the question you might still have is, after I doing all the bound correction process, what if the bound is still too loose? For example, I, if I get a lower bound that is far less than zero, then I cannot give you any guarantee because the lower bound is uh, less than zero. I cannot tell if the true function uh, minimum is greater than zero or not. So uh, the, the way of uh, making the bounds tighter and also allow to use the efficient bound propagation 
uh, is to use a technique called branch and bound. So we, uh, uh, we use branch and bound to improve the bounds and it makes our incomplete var verifier to become a complete verifier. So branch and bound actually is not a new technique. It has been used in MIP solvers for, for a long time. The MIP solver cannot really uh, uh, solve the neural net verification in a scalable way. But what we are doing here, we're trying to do here is uh, a combining branch and bound with bound propagation with a very efficient bound propagation method so that you can still, you can actually use some uh, branching to, in, in, uh, to improve the lower bounds uh, in an iterative manner. So initially we are, we are less than zero, but you have to do a lot of branching. The bounds can uh, improve slightly each time until you reach uh, positive bounds. That, that's that actually you can show you can verify it's complete. Complete means that given infinite number, uh, given infinite time, you can actually approach the true global minimum uh, as a MIP solver can do. Uh, because me solver also, also use branch and, and branch and bound um, as this underlying procedure. So how, how do we do branch and bound? So uh, for Redwood networks, it's, it's actually pretty easy because we know the Redwood network is piecewise linear. So we can just consider each Redwood neuron as two cases. Uh, the case where the Redwood neuron is always active and the case the Redwood neuron is always inactive. So by, by doing that, we were just adding uh, a simple additionally constraint for the problem, z1 greater than zero for the first case, and z1 less than zero for the second case. And you solve the two case of the problem. If both of them can be verified, then you know the original problem can be verified. So that's the, the high level idea of uh, uh, Burnton bounds. And by doing that, you, you're removing uh, you 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 you're moving the uh, you reducing you're reducing the number of neurons. Uh, you need to relax. You, you need to use the linear relaxations because originally you have to find the linear lower and upper bounds for this function. But now you don't have to because after do the branching, the relative function is uh linear. It's completely linear. We for 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 the input is, uh for the case input is always than zero. All the info the case the input is always negative. Um, and uh, by adding the split constraints to the problem um, and by splitting the problem into two sub problems, you're actually um, solving two easier sub problems uh, instead of one originally hard problems. Um, so uh, we extend the bound propagation framework. Uh, to the setting of branch and bound by also considering the uh, split constraints like 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 here z z one greater than zero z one less than zero so z one is basically the inputs of the red neuron um, and you can have many red neurons so z one is just one of the neuron you are currently splitting um, so uh, by using uh, Lagrangian methods we can actually add an additional optimization parameter beta into the bound propagation framework. That's, that's representing the split constraints. And you have you now you have additional optimization parameter beta. And by optimizing beta, actually you can make the bounds tighter um, to, to give the tighter lower bounds, which is similarly as what we did for optimizing alpha. Uh, so you can actually, what we are doing eventually is actually optimizing both alpha and beta to make the bounds uh, as tight as possible. And um, so after you adding this uh, split constraint, for example, uh, if originally the lower bound is minus three, so you cannot verify the problem because we want to prove the, the output is, uh, uh, greater than zero. After you do the split, you, you for each each of the problem becomes easier. Uh, so the lower bound actually improves. Uh, for example, for each case for this case, lower bound improved from minus three to minus two, and then for the other case, lower bound improved from minus three to zero point five. And as you can see here, for this case, the lower bound is already positive. So actually, you, you can you can tell this problem is already verified. But for this case, the lower bound is still negative. So you you still need to further to to further splitting to tell if the if the network is verified or not. Because here we only split one single neuron, Z1, and you probably have a hundred or thousands of neurons. We just continue to do the splitting. Of, of course, as you can imagine here, there are exponentially number of cases uh, to consider here. Essentially, we are building a branch and bound search tree. Uh, so we are speaking, for example, on the first neuron, second neuron, third neuron, fourth neuron. Uh, but usually the good thing is uh, you don't have to split all the neurons. As long as you split some of the neurons, 
uh, the lower bounds already becomes positive for all the cases. So uh, for if all the leaf nodes become positive, then you know the 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 uh, verification is successful. And for each case, for each time you are speaking in your you are you are improving the lower bound a little bit uh, until you can reach a positive lower bound where you can uh, terminate the solver. So uh, of course, um, uh, the worst case scenario is still have to explore an exponential number of sub problems. But that's a, because it's an NP complete problem. So we cannot really uh, give you a polynomial number of bounds here. So you, you have to explore the uh, uh, exponential number of neurons uh, in the worst case. But the good thing is for uh, most case, um, for the most natural we are, we are, we are using, uh, we, we are verifying, we, we can actually, a stronger verifier can give you a, a uh, can actually verify more properties uh, by making either making this bound tighter or making the branching procedure uh, smarter, for example. Um, and uh, usually you, you can also combine with some training techniques, for example, adding some regularizations during the training to make this bounds relatively tight. And you can um, you can conduct branch and bound on a trained network that is friendly for verification, for example, um, to 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 make the problem easier to solve. So essentially, we are still trying to solve the empty complete problem, and it's very hard and it can take exponential time in the worst case. But we are just trying to solve it as best as, as we can. For example, uh, the entire uh, branch and bound surgery can be built on GPUs, so you can actually explore a lot of nodes in this surgery. And in our experiments, we can sometimes explore like a million uh, nodes, and we can branch, but we can have a million branches also. Uh, um, and uh, so because you explore so much, a search, so, so uh, such a large search space, you can potentially solve this problem. Um, okay. Cool. And finally, um, uh, in my latest work, um, I show you like uh, how to actually improve the bounds using branch and bound, uh, using cutting plans. So because in branch and bound, we have to compute the bounds for each node. If this no these bounds can be tighter, actually, we can terminate the verification earlier. For example, if this minus 0 0.5 becomes uh, 0 0.1, you don't need to split the neural this three here. Um, so cutting flame method is actually a very popular approach used in uh, MIF solvers uh, by adding additional linear constraints into the problem that actually does not remove any integer solution of the problem because we know uh, the problem we are solving is essentially a MIF problem and the solution, optimum solution is always gonna be an integer solution. So it's gonna be some some of the points in the grid. Uh, but because we are using a uh, linear relaxation of this, we're solving a linearly relaxed problem. So our objective is gonna be weaker um, than, than the true global minimum. But uh, uh, what cutting plant methods are doing is actually cutting off all the regions without, uh, the without any inter solution. For example, this pink triangle um, and uh, by cutting off all those uh, regions without interior solutions, they can actually make the bounds tighter and make the solution closer to the interior solution at a high level. So I, I cannot go over all the details for the cutting for this matter today, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, what we are doing at high level is that we generalize the speed constraint in beta -crum. Because in beta -crum, we can we can add a single constraint which is a neuron split constraint speed the neuron to the positive or negative case into the verification problem. And now here we can um, we can generalize to any cutting plane constraint. You can you can add a constraint that involves any number of neurons from any layers, and you can still solve the problem uh, without a uh, linear programming solver. Because traditionally, if you are solving such a problem with additional linear constraint, you have to use a linear, a linear programming solver such as Groovy to solve it. But we don't need to use linear programming solver. We can solve the problem with additional constraints still with uh, a GPU accelerated bound propagation, but the bound propagation rule becomes uh, more complex. And we found that this is actually very powerful and can double the number of solved problems in some of the benchmarks. And if you're interested in this paper, you can check out here. It's just uh, uploaded to archive uh, last month. So uh, finally, I will show you some benchmarks and results and show you uh, what we can do for neural net verification so far. So there is a popular benchmark called Over 20. 
uh, that has been used in many uh, be, uh man, many previous papers on neural network verification. And uh, so uh, compared to the baseline in 2017, uh, using MIPS solver, uh, you can see that um, so. Uh, if you're using MIPS solver, for example, you even you, you, you uh, even under a thousand sets second running time, you can only verify maybe fifty percent of the all the properties. For example, there are three benchmarks or three networks where results are similar. Uh, but if you're using our latest uh, Alpha Beta Chrome verifier, you can do the same actually using just the two second, two or three seconds or so. Uh, to do the same um, as the MIPS solver can do uh, using over a thousand uh, seconds. So basically that means you can, we actually have two to three orders of magnitude speed up compared to the, the things um, uh, in 2017. And of course, as you can see here, there are many other baselines as well. And uh, um, that basically shows the improvements of the field during the years. And uh, after five years, we, we get like two to three orders uh, of magnitude uh, speed up, and the, uh, the improvement comes from the efficient bound propagation because you don't need to rely on a CPU bound MIPS solver or LPC solver, um, and also we uh, comes from the optimization we use to make the bounds tighter, and also branch and bound, and also the cutting point method. So we can. Uh, another interesting fact is also you can see that uh, given uh, an hour timeout. Um, uh, none of the existing solvers can actually completely solve a hundred percent problem inside this benchmark. Uh, but uh, you can see our method can actually solve a hundred percent of the problem. That means this benchmark is completely solved and completely solved very, um, very fast. You can see uh, you just take a few hundred seconds in, in the worst case to completely solve the benchmark. So this benchmark essentially becomes too easy. Um, and the more challenging uh, benchmarks are from the um, uh, neural network verification competition within comp. So we have a yearly competition for neural network verifiers. Um, and uh, the, the first uh, uh, competition we participated was last year, within comp 2021. And the uh, 12 teams participated and each team uh, submitted a tool. And the tool is evaluated on a standardized AWS environment on a set of standardized benchmarks. And the evaluation is done by competition organizers, not by the, the two developers. So everything is evaluated on the same environment, same benchmarks, and the, uh, the evaluation is very fair. So you can get a fair comparison for all the benchmarks because if you just read papers, everyone probably claims they are the best because they, they, they probably tune the method for, for, for their case. Uh, but in this competition, everything is fair because you, you are running a standardized uh, environment using in the same benchmarks. And, and there are eight benchmarks in the uh, uh, last year's competition. And the benchmarks basically um, uh, have applications from image classification control and database. And uh, each benchmark basically con contains some properties verify. And each property is basically the, a relationship of the input spec specification and also the specification. For example, uh, if the input is within this region, the output is uh, uh, need to satisfy this condition. Now that's that's the properties we need to verify. And uh, each benchmark has different properties different property depends on the application. And the issue tries to verify as many as uh, properties within a time law limit. And the maximum score is 800 uh, because there are eight, eight benchmarks and uh, each benchmark you have a score of 100. And uh, there are 12 teams participating and uh, there are teams from um, universities uh, uh, from everywhere in the world, for example, we, we are the CMU team and we're actually collaborating with other universities as well. And there are also teams from Imperial College London, Oxford, UIC, Stanford, and so on. And you can see we are getting a score very close to 800. Uh, that, that is the highest score you can achieve, actually, and the gap between the second and third place actually are pretty large. And if you look at the number of uh, problems we can solve for each benchmark, you can also see that we can actually solve the most number of 
problems for every single benchmark, thanks to our very efficient bond propagation uh, and optimization and branch and bond, all, all the procedures I introduced earlier. And, uh, and also we have this uh, competition this year, uh, this year we have more benchmarks because we 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 are allowing benchmark proposer from the industry. So there are actually people from autonomous vehicles uh, company and uh, aerospace company and so on. They're proposing some properties that are useful for for their task. For example, image segmentation, reinforcement learning, and time series prediction, and so on. So that all of these are valid applications of neural network verification and. Uh, Essentially, because you just need to define uh, what the input specifications are, what the output specifications are, and uh, the tools are general and can handle a wide range, range of input and output specifications. And, and, um, and uh, so we have actually 13 benchmarks and 11 teams in this year's competition. And many teams actually are from last year's uh, uh, competition. And uh, they, they improve their tools, and we do see a lot of progress uh, uh, in this year. And there are also four new teams. Um, and uh, also, the networks have also become larger. So we have, say, 500 10 inch net and even 10 inch, even image net models in this competition. So uh, the algorithm has to be very scalable. You have to, for example, everything has to be GPU accelerated. Otherwise, we will never be able to uh, verify these networks. Uh, so results is like um, uh, there are 13 benchmarks, so the maximum score is um, 1300. Uh, and we are also getting a score that is very close to the maximum score. Uh, and if you look at uh, the number of verified problems for, versus time over all the problems in the 13 benchmarks, you can see that, for example, we can solve um, like, uh, like uh, around 70-ish. Um, to 80 ish percent of the problems within 10 seconds. Yeah, and uh, so for this figure, because the X axis is a number of instances verified, the X, Y axis is the time. Uh, if the curve is on the bottom right side, it means the verifier is stronger. You can see we are actually faster and also solve the most number of instances um, across all the 13 benchmarks. And um, uh, that's all the competition results. And uh, but still, although we achieve a very good results for the computation, uh, we know that um, it's still very hard for to verify uh, very large networks. For example, for for the image net benchmark in the wing computation, like uh, we also cannot struggle. We cannot verify a, a very a complex property, and there's still some limitations there. Um, and uh, we, we we have seen a lot of for pro, pro, progress during the uh, last five years. Uh, we, we can actually, to as I showed you before, we can have like two to three orders of magnitude speed up on some problems, but the, the, there are still very large networks. For example, the networks people are using these sets are even larger than uh, just convolutional network like ResNet, which people are using vision transformers and uh, uh, even larger models. And uh, um, these are really hard to verify, actually. And also, practically, you also have more complex specifications. For example, not just the saying the, the, the input is the LP norm bounded ball. Your input can be in a more complex region. Um, and that's that's also very challenging. Um, and a few things I can think about like is how to solve this challenge problem. Um, and our perspective is to, to make the verifier more scalable, make the verifier faster, developing method to give the tighter bounds. But another way is we can also try to train the network in a way that is uh, branch and bound friendly. Um, and still, we don't have a clear answer how to train the network uh, to make it for, uh, friendly for verification, and as well as also do not sacrifice uh, performance too much. And also, um, there's also a question which is often asked, like, what's the best uh, neural network ar architecture for verification? Because there are certain operations which can have very loose bounds and can have trouble during verification. An example is the attention uh, mechanism used uh, in transformers, which is not very friendly for verification. Um, and also there, 
Um, so we don't know like uh, what's the best architecture. Maybe you, if you don't use railway activation, if you can produce a neural activation function, maybe you can solve the verification problem easier and uh, achieve better results. And also it's, pro it's possible to combine with other types of models like trees and KNs. This model is actually much easier to verify compared to um, to the neural network verification. I, I actually, I also worked a little bit on verification of tree ensembles and uh, uh, the things there are much nicer compared to neural networks. It's just the uh, things that are just easier to verify. So uh, so there's still a lot of open challenges here in this field. And I hope like more people can get attention and uh, uh, start working on this problem and uh, makes the, the AI more verifiable for future applications. So I think that's a, that's going to be the end of my talk today. And we're interested to uh, my verification too. You can check out uh, our two at abcrown.org. And uh, if you want to learn more, more details of our algorithm, you can you should check out our tutorial uh, at neuronetverification.com. And we have videos and slides um, to go over all the detailed maths there to, for, for you to get started. Okay, Thank you. That's the end of my talk. Uh, thanks, Juan. Yeah, let's let's thank our speaker for the amazing talk. And, uh, and yeah, the floor is open for questions. So, Mark, you have a question? Uh, yes, thank you for the amazing talk, first of all. Um, uh, I have a couple of questions, but I'll start with the fun and then give other people the opportunity to chime in as well. Um, yeah. Do you have an intuition on what kind of constraints or cutting planes GCP uh, bits or rather CPLEX learns or uses, for example, compared to the multi-neural constraints, which, which right. are kind of uh, quite similar conceptually. Yeah, that, that's actually a very good question. So we, we looked at the cut influence generated by the, the MIPS server because for that paper, we are using MIPS server to generate the cut influence. And we found actually most uh, of them are involving multiple, neural, multiple neurons, like uh, at least maybe 10 neurons or even more. It can be 100 neurons or even more. So the constraints are actually quite complicated. Uh, they involve uh, you know, neurons from multiple layers. For example, there can be some neurons from the input layer uh, and some neurons from, from the later layers and so on. And uh, they, they are definitely much more complex than, for example, the multi-neural relaxation we have so far. Um, and, but I, I guess still the challenge is how to find all the, the useful cutting plans without uh, without the MIPS solver, right? That, that's that's a that's a that's a that's a bigger question here because we MIPS solver is still limiting our uh, scalability. Although although we are not solving it uh, solving the problem completely using MIPS solver, just using to find the cutting plans. Uh, we 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 hope to find some better ways of finding this powerful and the general kind of influence. Um, because in MIPS over, they actually they are specialized algorithm to generate the kind of influence, such as uh Gormary cuts uh, and the mixed integer rounding cuts. Uh, for example, for, so for Gormary cuts, you need the you need the primal solutions uh, of the LP problem, uh, which actually we cannot easily obtain if you use bound propagation methods. If you have the primal solution of the LG problem, you can construct uh, very effective cuts using Gormary cuts. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, under our current verification framework, uh, it's really hard to, to uh, incorporate these powerful cutting plans uh, directly uh, without relying on MIPS over. I think that's a problem we should definitely discuss more and look further um, to, to, to solve. And I hope someone can propose better methods to find a cutting place. Yeah. May I ask a direct follow-up question there? Can, how, roughly how many cutting planes do you incorporate and how much does this impact your propagation time? Yeah, so uh, roughly we are uh, incorporate like a, a thousand cutting planes or so around that number. You, you can do more like, a, but of course it's gonna be small. Floor. And we, we, uh, for the benchmarks, we for the building computation benchmarks, we are limiting numbers to about a thousand or so. And that roughly um, increases the propagation time by maybe 50% or so. 
fifty percent to a hundred percent. The hundred percent is basically twice slower. So there's definitely overhead there. So you definitely want to include useful cutting plans. That you can, for example, if you include a billion cutting plans, but uh, not all of them are useful. Only one of them are useful. Then you're wasting a lot of time to 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 solve the problem, right? Definitely to 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 find a very small set of uh, useful cutting plans there. So yeah, um, we're using about a thousand cutting plans. Thanks for the great answers. Uh, we have another question from uh, uh, Zach uh, uh, Not sure how to pronounce yeah, the name. So it's, sorry. It's Jack Jack Schilick. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation. So um, yeah, I have a couple questions. Uh, mm -hmm. The first one: It seems like that uh, the branch inbound algorithms are very much uh, specified to the real networks. Right. Uh, so uh, other some complete verifiers, for example, for transformers? Oh, no, not at this time. I, I think we, uh, people need to work on this to develop a com complete verifier to, to transformers or other more complex activations. Uh, because uh, the, the nice thing of, about ReLU is that after we do the branch and mount, uh, the two cases are both linear. So you you don't have uh, you have no relaxation. So that means you can achieve completeness. But for other activation functions, even if you do the branching, uh, you you got to solve problems, but you still need relaxations for for the for the for the for the neuron, uh, for the nonlinear function for each case. Uh, so it's hard to achieve actually achieve complete verification. But you can still achieve improvements on the final on the final bounds. Uh, I, I think that's a direction worth doing. Uh, it's basically uh, investigating what's the best way of doing branch and bound for uh, for non relu networks. For example, you have more complex uh, activations like Paxos using transformers. And uh, because in this case, uh, for relu networks, it's, it's easy because you only have one way of cutting the cutting the neurons into two, uh, two sub problems. But for other activation functions, for example, the easiest way is uh, use the activation function for the sigmoid. It's a it's an easy activation function. You you have to choose where to cut and how many cats you, you want to add there because you you, you not not like Red Bull, you only have one one unique way to cutting to to cast the activation function into two places. But for the sigmoid, actually, you have a, a different story, and I think that's just definitely worth studying. And no one. It's really doing that as it's put, I guess. So we definitely, we, I hope to see some, some paper uh, doing that uh, in, in, in near future, actually. Yeah. Okay. And um, yeah, my second question is about uh, more about training. So it's known that, for example, the uh, neural networks trained with the interval bound propagation method uh, are very much. Uh, uh, I the, they are easily verified with this, the same IBP. Right. Uh, verifier, but uh, for example, the, this even Crown works worse on, on those networks. Uh, the, the reason Crown works worse is because you're not using the optimized bounds. If you use Alpha Crown, it's all, always going to be better. So, okay. Yeah. And, and, and generally, what's, what's your thoughts about robust training, uh, both to, in theoretical perspective and, and practical perspective? I think, oh, I think we definitely need to find better ways other than IBP for, for training a verifiable network. Because if you're using IBP, uh, the network is highly uh, regularized, right? So uh, to, to achieve a verification. Um, but but you, you know, IB, uh, IBP is a very weak verification method. So if we can um, lose that constraint a little bit, for example, if we run the network using complete verifier, so we, we so we don't need to add a lot of constraints to the network during training. You can get better clean accuracy, and you can potentially also get good uh, verified accuracy because you, you are using a stronger verifier. Well, one thing we tried before is uh, mixing adversarial training and IBP training. Well, what they tried before was, uh, for example, for tiny internet, um, for tiny internet, which uh, the model is rather large, um, and uh, for example, we, we are using a twenty layer rest net, and we, we are using a loss function that involves ninety nine percent of uh, out of cell chaining loss and one percent of IBP loss, just a li very little percent percentage of IBP loss, and uh, if you train the network using that loss function. 
um, the networks cannot be verified using IBP because you you only have one percent of IBP loss there. But if you run the network using Alpha Beta Chrome, actually you can get a verified accuracy higher than a network trained purely using IBP, and uh, and, and also the clean accuracy is also better. Because you're, you're sort of using adversarial training and you only have 1% of IBP loss there. That 1% of IBP loss serves as a regular, regular regularization to make the bounds relatively tight and friendly for complete verifiers, uh, but not too, too bad for in terms of the regularization impact on the network. So, so that's one thing we tried before. Um, so that's, that's just a naive combination of the two loss, so of the two losses. I think there should be better ways to uh, get better uh, to to get a network that's easier to verify and also um, easier for training and scalable for training and also does not sacrifice the clean accuracy too much. Yep. Thanks. Yep. Mm, I think. Uh, so, Mark, do you have uh, additional questions? If, if you still have the time, yes. Yeah, yeah, I, I have time. Yeah, I'm brilliant. Would. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so one question I have, I, I noticed that you made quite a few kind of implementational improvements with your most yeah. recent version of, I guess, GCP or, or the competition mm -hmm. version of Alpha Beta Cron. Yeah. Um, and, and also in, in your GCP paper, you sometimes see you consider um, more branches or more sub problems and are still faster than, for example, last year's competition version of Alphabet Chrome. So I was wondering if you had benchmarked a GCP versus the most recent version of Alphabet Chrome and how much of a difference there kind of only the general cutting yeah. point make. Yeah, yeah, we benchmarked that. I think it highly depends on the benchmarks. So for, 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 for example, if you're using a very large network, which MIP server cannot scale um, on that model, uh, then you cannot find any cutting plans. So that, that, that the GCP cron will work uh, similarly as beta cron. Uh, I mean, the latest uh, using the latest code because you're not you, you're not finding any cutting plans. So as long as the cutting plans are added, can be added, it's usually beneficial uh, as I, I in my experience. So so we did try to benchmark, for example, uh, for example, beta cron, uh, the latest implementation of beta cron and GCP cron. And uh, on, for example, for the competition, we benchmarked the two on all the ben on all the benchmarks. And we decided to uh, to uh, to enable GCP cron or not enable GCP cron. So we did definitely did this, this benchmark. Uh, and for, for for some benchmarks, for example, the um, the the OO twenty one benchmark, uh, the improvement is is so so big that you can verify almost a double number of instances there. You if you add cutting plans, but for some networks, like for example the REST network network you proposed in this year uh, uh, computation, uh, the ban we also tried to use cutting plans, but the benefits is marginal. So we so in the computation we de we decided to disable it. So. Yeah. That's quite interesting because they are the multi neural constraints bring a big right. improvement and they're not so powerful and over. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, actually, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, it's, it's so very, I guess. So I, I mean, I also ran GCP a bit, and sometimes I saw also different oval, kind of just different instances of the oval benchmark, and sometimes it doubles the performance, and sometimes it's just the delta of one is like 5% or so. So it's, it seems like it's really varying. So I thought maybe you have interesting insights on, on why that is that potentially could also help kind of shape better what, what makes good cutting planes or... Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think because when you add cutting planes, it all, always involves some additional uh, additional optimization time, right? It just depends on how... Uh, how how good the cutting plans are, right? So uh, so you can you can know how good it is by, for example, looking at the the, the output of the MIPS hour if you're using MIPS hour to find the cutting plans. Uh, but uh, for example, you, you can you can check the prime the dual bounds in the MIPS hour and see like how much it improves with its cutting plan. So if the improvement is very little, it's probably not worth the effort. You 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 just use the time to do more branching, right? That's uh, that's more beneficial. So yeah, I I think one uh one thing we should um uh, definitely think about like is like uh, 
uh, how, how, for example, how to uh, train our models so we can easily find the powerful cutting plants. Uh, I think that I, I don't still don't know the, the uh, direct answer to that problem yet. So if we can train our uh, network, for example, adding some constraint to certain neurons during training, so that I know like a cutting plan involving these neurons will be very powerful. Um, that's probably gonna make things much better because uh, um, it, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, we need to have better ways to training the network, just not just using IBP, right? Uh, uh, essentially, we are trying to say that, oh, I can have a network which is very, very hard to verify just using income to verify. But as long as I do some branch and bound, the network is much easier to verify. For example, I, I want to have a network that is trained in that way, but it is kind of hard at this point. We, 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 I don't know how, how to achieve that goal. So what we, we, just, we, we did was just uh, adding a uh, IBT regularization, uh, but we, I don't know any better ways of like training the network such as friendly for cutting plants and uh, branch and bone. Yeah, I don't know actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. If, if, yeah. I, if I could still ask one, one more question maybe, uh, I don't want to keep people up though. Is, is kind of on the importance of floating point precision. Um, uh -huh. I, I think for a lot of the uh, benchmarks and for example, this year's competition, it was, was very important to do the evaluation with double precision or otherwise you just got garbage results. Um, and uh, I, I noticed that you do kind of final bounding passes with double precision, but the optimization of all the slopes with single precision, at least sometimes. Yeah, we, we did have that trick, yeah. I, I, I was wondering um, how effect or how close you get if you kind of normalize for, let's say, backpropagation steps or kind of don't consider compute, but just comp uh, consider the number mm -hmm. of made passes, um, how much performance you lose by using kind of a different objective during optimization using the float 32 objective or float 32 propagation. Um, yeah, uh, I think uh, from the result we are getting, uh, because we uh, uh, most of the time we spend was on the alpha and the beta optimizations, right? So and these optimizations can be done using uh, single precision. And even we consider using half precision, but we, we were not able to influence that uh, in time before the computation. But for, for all the optimization, you can do that in reduced uh, reduced uh, precision. But uh, the final for the final iteration, you can do that in double precision using the optimized alpha and beta values. Um, I, I think the performance impact is quite small if you do this in that way, uh, because the, the majority of time was spent on the optimization loop. For example, you optimize for 50 iterations, yeah. and yeah. the 50 iterations are fast. Only yeah, the no, last I, I, I it in is, a different way. Yeah. So uh, this 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 I thought was a very clever trick because then you save save massive amount of time there. Um, yeah. No. Uh, what what I was wondering more because effectively your loss function, your objective differs potentially significantly if the network or if kind of the propagation behavior changes a lot depending on the precision that you use. Um, so I was yeah. wondering kind of if the bound tightness effectively changed a lot or depending on which precision you used for the optimization. Process. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I didn't look very detailed results and see how much the difference are, but uh, uh, my impression was the difference is very little. So okay. it's very little. So because uh, 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 in the final round of bound propagation, what we essentially have is uh, uh, the, the alpha and the beta are set using the single precision values, but, but they're already very close to the optimal values because you know like all the alpha beta, they're two variables of the linear uh, programming yeah. relaxation, yeah. right? So uh, you already have a value that's very close to the to the to the optimal solution. For example, then even if uh, it uh, has a slight uh, error in, uh, due to the precision difference, it doesn't actually change result that much. Actually, so yeah. Very so the, yeah, the, the impact is very minimal. I think if you are seeing a bigger impact. Uh, if you do see a bigger impact case, maybe we, we can discuss offline. I guess that, that's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. I guess so. Uh, in my impression, the impact is very very small. So in terms of the precision, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe let's discuss further another time. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry for running over time. <laughs>
so much. <laughs> that, that's totally all right. I uh, guess it's, uh, it's just only like few of us. So this is an open discussion anyway. But yeah, uh, thanks again, Juan. This was very, very amazing talk. And uh, yeah, uh, then, thank, thanks again. Uh, I'll, I'll post the recording on the website and I'll send you the link too. So. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for organizing uh, the talk series and uh, thank you for inviting me again. You're welcome. Um, so all, all right, uh, see everyone next week. Then. See, you. see you, bye. Thanks, bye-bye.